by everything. It's inspired young people. Inspiration comes from within you. When you clear out the garbage that's in your mind, you then create space for something better, more beautiful to come in. Let's have life and have it more abundantly. I say yes. It's like taking a workshop. I get to be in my pajamas. We have a very active imagination, which is why it's important to learn how to harness it and then point it in the direction you want to go. I listen to your show every day. It's time now for Living Your Inspired Life with Susan Burrell. Susan is no-nonsense, inspirational, motivational, and fun. This is positive talk radio. Practical wisdom for everyday life. It's a gift you give yourself. Now, here's Susan. And welcome to Living Your Inspired Life. You're listening to News Talk 1590 KVTA. And here at Living Your Inspired Life, we're all about positive talk radio, bringing uh, life-changing ideas to the airwaves so that you can contemplate them and maybe even act on some of them. And if you miss anything on our show, you can go to livingyourinspiredlife.org and tune in and tune up and develop your power perspective. So today... uh, We are completing, in essence, our series on the uh, shootings in Isla Vista that happened uh, last month, and I am deeply grateful and honored to have the director of the Women's Gender and Sexual Equality Center up at UCSB. I'm joined with Jill Dunlap. Hi, Jill. Hi. Hi. I really appreciate you being here because I know that you and your center have personally been doing so much over the past month for everything that's been, plus there was graduation and, you know, changeover and all that stuff since the the shooting. So I just wanted to hear a little bit of your perspective of how things unfolded right after and what was the biggest challenges besides grief that you guys were witnessing? Sure. I I think I was really proud to be a part of an institution that responded so comprehensively and really um, just with absolutely just heartfelt was was what I felt by um, being around my colleagues and all just really working closely together to make sure that the students felt supported and um, the outreach and outpouring of support from the community in Santa Barbara and in Goleta and in Isla Vista was really, really heartwarming as well. And to see everybody come together after a tragedy like that made, you know, getting up every day in the hard days really worth it. Um, and my thanks go out to the, to the counselors, the volunteer counselors and the counselors um, at our campus that were just just so um, ready to respond and yet gave and gave and gave of their time in order to make sure that students who were grieving or who were feeling, um, you know, in crisis after that happened, um, coming forward and being able to support those students was, it was just an amazing effort on behalf of everybody at the, at the campus. Yeah. And I I imagine it's going to be a a rocky summer for many, many people uh, by go, you know, those kids that went home for the summer after experiencing that and not necessarily being, with their fellow students to continue that grieving process. It's going to be interesting to see what happens when everybody gets back in the fall. Yeah, I think I'd like to think of it as being a really um, good opportunity for them to get support from their families. And um, I do think there are, you know, there's some when you're in it, it's, you know, it's all you can talk about. and It's all you can think about. And so I think a lot of students are really grateful for the time to go home this summer and get some, you know, extra hugs from family and and to sort of um, feel normalized a little bit. Right. um, Apart from what was a very chaotic and stressful end to the quarter for a lot of students. Yeah. Uh, and you, too, and your <laughs> yeah. staff. Yeah, absolutely. I think the staff is looking forward to a little bit of a lull in the summer. It definitely doesn't stop, and we work straight through. But um, I do think that there is a sense now of hoping to take a deep breath and, and start to feel um, a sense of normalcy on campus. And not that things will ever really go back to being normal, but to the extent that we can return to projects that we were working on before and um, try not to think of it as a before and after kind of scenario, I think that will that will really help um, the the professional staff on on campus who were so deeply involved to return to a sense of normalcy. You know, it's interesting because on our show, we've been talking about uh, the new normal, Mm -hmm. which is where we all are collectively on the planet of, okay, so when tragedies like this happen, there, there, it's, it's very hard, probably impossible to go back to normal because now there's voids. Mm -hmm. But to develop what would be the new normal, mm-hmm. reset the uh, lifestyle and the uh, ideas and your thoughts and your just the way you live life 
based on a new normal, which would include having experienced brutal and witnessed uh, death. Right. And I think for some of those students, that will absolutely alter the the trajectory of their lives. And um, I, I like to get up and, and convince myself in the mornings that it's it's for some people a really good trajectory and that it will change what they want to do with their lives or their sense of community or making sure that this doesn't happen somewhere else. And so I think that um, a lot of us are trying to focus on the really positive aspects of it and the sense of community that's being built um, in, in Isla Vista. And not that there wasn't a sense of community there before, but it looks different, I yes, think. I would imagine. And so I think it's, um, it's just something that we're you know, telling ourselves and, and continuing to hope for that that the positives that came out of this really terrible tragedy will continue and the ripple effects um, of the positive reaction will continue mm-hmm. into next fall. Mm-hmm. Now, uh, since I was a sorority girl mm-hmm. in college, uh, I'm curious because there because Elliot Rogers' manifesto was kind of aimed at, at the sorority system also. So I'm curious as to how the how the Women's Gender and Sexual Equality Center has been working with the Greek system up there to kind of, like you said, maybe reshift perspective. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's one of the things that we're looking toward for fall and um, letting students, again, sort of take a moment and grieve. And um, I I think we got a lot of calls after about like, what are you doing? And and knowing that it takes a minute for it to set in um, for those students. And they've had a lot of outreach and they've, um, you know, there were counselors in their houses and that sort of thing. And um, that they can also feel really overwhelmed. Mm -hmm. And so I think looking toward fall and reconvening with them when they come back to campus and also talking about how do you um, how do you involve new students who th- that wasn't their experience you know they're coming to UCSB with a fresh start and they're aware of it obviously but how do you bring in new sorority members who um, want to be a part of something positive and something flourishing and yet you also have those who were there and who you know felt targeted mm-hmm. um, by the manifesto so I think that having those kinds of conversations with um, Greek women about how do we move forward and honor at the same time what has happened will be really important um, and reaching out they, they have a really strong um, Greek advisor there who spoke at the memorial service um, that people may have heard and she has absolutely been their rock and their foundation and so working through her I think who already has those personal connections I think will be more meaningful than sort of you know another you know somebody coming in and saying what can we do Um, and just sort of seeing what their needs are and checking in with them about you know what are they feeling and and where do they where do they want us and where do Mm -hmm. they want our help rather than us coming in and saying here's what we think you know should happen after this but really listening to them and I think that's going to be the approach that we'll take with them. I, I really uh, applaud that and respect that because I think that deep listening is the only way that uh, we as human beings can learn how to uh, be of service to others and be compassionate at the same time. And so many people want to rush in and this, and you know, order people around or whatever. And again, we talk about this on Living Your Inspired Life. That kind of um, mentality, I believe personally, is kind of... Um, a done deal you know Mm -hmm. it's kind of like that's over Mm -hmm. and it's more important to sit and listen and dialogue not direct but dialogue to really hear what are the needs not from a past generation's needs but from the current generation's needs right absolutely and and i think that that's um just really the approach that that we've taken and i um myself and my colleagues and i i think that you're your statement and your sense of that is also really correct about the the importance of listening because us going in and saying you all need to have individual counseling or your your house in particular needs to do this in order to heal isn't genuine and so I think listening to those women and hearing you know they're changing needs as they come back next fall and saying how can we support you and we are here for you um, I think will will take us a lot further in helping them heal rather than sort of a you know one size fits all mentality of here's how we think you should you know yeah. uh, you know get better um, or over come this. Mm-hmm. And, and I appreciate uh, what you're sharing with me, Jill, too, because um, I've done grief counseling. And I, what I know is when it when the death occurs, it the immediacy is everybody wants to come and help fix, give them food, whatever it is. And then it's generally the three or four months later when the individual who's left uh, as the survivor, if you will, turns around and says, but 
now is when I need people. Where is everybody? So it, it's going to be awesome that you guys are going to be proactive when everybody gets back to school and checking in. Yeah, I think, um, I unfortunately, I have a unique perspective as well that I was at Northern Illinois University when there was an on-campus shooting in 2008, and we lost five students um, and had several others injured. And it, it was exactly that. It was this sort of, you know, campus morning, and then, you know, there's these stages, right? You have a memorial service, which brings closure, and then you have, you know, the coming back in the fall and people being sort of stressed about that um, and, you know, getting over that hump. And yet the needs are really going to evolve. And I think that this is going to be a long-term um long-term approach to to trying to return to normal because it just isn't, you know, okay, great, we got them off for the summer and now we're done. And I think that um, my colleagues are on campus really understand that and we're, you know, taking a deep breath now, but then looking ahead at the fall and, and, and what does this mean for us in the fall and what are the students anticipating what the students' needs may be in the fall in terms of recovery and healing. My goodness, what a unique position you're in having experienced it once. Not that I would wish that on anybody the first time, but what a unique gift you bring to this university and this program and the students having already kind of, if you will, walked through this and gone, okay. And an opportunity for maybe making changes that that might be more beneficial than what you were able to do in the past. I mean, that's a blessing. It really is in a really tragic wow, way to, I know. You know, to wow. have been in this field in higher education for 12 years and to have experienced that twice. And, yep, that's, um, and you know, you talk about the new normal and that's the sort of real downside that I try not to think about a lot about, you know, that no one should ever experience that in their workplace, but to have, you know, had to deal with the the students and, and the loss of students and at two campuses is really heartbreaking. Yeah, I, uh, I had a couple weeks ago, I had a retired L.A. PD homicide uh, lieutenant on and to talk about this violence amping up. And of course, the day we recorded, there was the shooting in uh, Washington Mm -hmm. on campus. And um, but and one of the things he said is this is this isn't a, a one time. It's a trend that is continuing and will continue. So to think, oh, thank God, it just happened. Now we don't have to worry about it. No, it's happening at too many places and the frequency is less I mean it's more and more so the time mm-hmm. between is less and um, and not to be a downer but I guess just to be kind of and not even saying that that's reality reality but just to be aware that this these things occur I would imagine it's been a game changer in Isla Vista proper on how the kids operate and behave yeah, I think that'll be an interesting, again, I think you sort of, you know, hit on the nail on the head earlier about, you know, they, a lot of students may have chosen not to come back, you know, or stayed home and um, finished finals from home or whatever that looked like for them. And so I think we'll we'll really see again in the fall what, what sorts of changes there are and, um, you know, if the, the culture there looks different. And um, again, I think both in positive and negative ways in terms of um, students maybe being more skittish or, you know, not um, feeling comfortable walking around, you know, in those same areas where it happened. Um, but I also think the the sort of memorial sites have really served to not let people sweep it under the rug and that it, ha- it remains salient for students. And I think that um, it'll, it'll be interesting to see what sorts of um, behaviors change or look different or whatever in the fall when the students come back. So we're anticipating that and, and their needs as that as they come back to campus. Yeah. I want to read to everyone what the mission statement is of your center because um, to me, and maybe it's just me, but uh, I think this is a pretty powerful uh, vision and mission to stand on. I'm just, I'm in awe and gratitude again. So the women, this is the mission statement. The Women, Gender, and Sexual Equality Department uses a feminist approach to provide support advocacy, resources, and education to the UCSB community. This is what I underlined. We value and respect all genders, gender expressions, bodies, sexual orientations, and racial and ethnic identities while challenging all forms of oppression. We work towards creating a campus environment that is safe, equitable, and just. Okay, to me right there, I think that that's the way the entire world needs to operate. And, and, and the, the fact that it's about support and education, to me, is like, yeah, that it's 
it's what we've been needing for oh so long. And this center, everybody, was uh, originated in the mid 1970s, and it was a women's center first, right, Jill? Mm -hmm. Yes. S so go speak a little bit more about that. Um, I think it, it's we're really proud of that mission statement, and we really feel like rather than something that we just kind of hang on the wall, we really you know eat, live, sleep, and breathe it, um, and that it, it informs the work that we do every day. And so um, I, you know, a lot of times people say, you know, why are women's centers even around on campuses anymore? And I oh, think my goodness. in a lot of ways, the um, the videos and the manifesto and the resulting conversation that has happened nationally and the yes, all women hashtag. And um, we, I want to talk about that too. I got some, I, some, yeah. And, and I think that, I mean, the, the fact that women do still face these kinds of things and and the the kinds of um, things that were coming out of the shooter's mouth. I think um, you know we hear those kinds of things in our daily lives and we and we sweep it under the rug and say, oh, you know, boys will be boys and that kind of thing. And so I feel really fortunate that um, it, you know that women on our campus have a place to go where if they come back in the fall and they're still struggling with, you know, what was said and if they read the manifesto and, and all of those things, that they have a place where they can come and talk through that. And I think that's a major part of what our space does is provide women that space to, to explore and to talk about when things make them feel not okay and um, attitudes and, and misogyny and, you know, all of the academic terms and, and that kind of thing. But I, I feel really fortunate for our students that they have our space. I'm I'm so grateful again. I'm just this I think this entire hour I'm just gonna be in gratitude for the work you do, Jill. Be, and let's talk about this hashtag yes all women. Um because and several organizations have talked about it, you know, in the in the media and uh, the, the the women that started that were brilliant. They were brilliant. And the fact that the, eventually they had to remove it and remove themselves also speaks volumes of why sexual harassment and sexual abuse of women, now I'm just talking about women because I know that there's sexual abuse of men, straight or gay, but the sexual abuse of women continues. It's, it's amazing to me. When you think about it, the suffragette movement that got women the vote in this country, in America, is really... Our, our ability to vote is really just about 100 years old. Now, that is f amazing to me. That's, like, astounding to me. And then I had a, a, a guest on last week, Kate Montana, and uh, her book is called Unearthing Venus. And in it, she mentions that in 1974, a single woman was not allowed, not allowed to have a bank account that that's like and I was I well I was a call I was in high school and then college during that time but it and I got a checking account because my parents supported that you know they they're the ones that opened it for me it never dawned on me that I couldn't have gotten one you right. know or that my parents had to do that for me so that I could have one and now that's something that all, all young uh, adults I think just take for granted oh yeah now I'm on my own I got a I got an ATM card with a checking account attached to it no big deal but that's less that's not even 50 years ago right that women couldn't yeah well and I think even even too looking at you know the you were referencing you know sexual sexual harassment and, and sexual violence and understanding that that's a continuum and you know that until the Anita Hill hearings we didn't even have a word for sexual harassment oh my and God bless that too yeah and her recent you know documentary was just a great reminder of you know her story and her journey and the fact that we didn't even have a word for it until she came through and now we're moving in the direction where everybody's you know in, in California is supposed to have training on what that looks like and and now you see the White House task force report and I think you see the evolution of sexual harassment yes but also sexual violence like it's time that we're talking about it and it's time that um, that we talk about it in the same ways that we talk about other problems and that it is serious and so I think I'm really grateful that there's some national attention being focused on this work because like I said I've been doing it for 12 years and it was a pretty thankless job for a while and it's been pretty great in the past year to to wake up and see um, you know this issue and the topic of sexual violence on campus is really being addressed mm-hmm yeah so uh 
See now, okay. So let me talk about since I, I I'll represent the past, and you can talk about the present, and then hopefully we'll get to the future. But in my day, way back when, when I was in college, you know, you you went. I I was a sorority person. I went to frat parties. There there was way too much drinking. There were probably drugs, but I was too naive. And uh, but there was always there was always a guy coming on to somebody in a way that really wasn't appropriate. And the woman or women didn't really we didn't really have any idea how to uh, how to redirect that or how to set up the boundary. So it didn't happen again. You know, and these are these are some guys that, you know, after college and once everybody sobers up, you know, they're wonderful individuals. But boy, get a keg of beer in them, and it's like, look out. In fact, Jill, I was talking to a young man, a 20-year-old, 20, a 20 year old, right after the shootings in Isla Vista, and, and he's, he said he goes up, he would go up to, he doesn't live in Isla Vista, he lives in Ojai, but he would go up there and party and all this stuff, and you know, because that's the college hangout, and he was doing it in high school, and he said, I won't go up there anymore, it's just too... It's too scary. It's too violent. I said, wow. And he goes, you know, in, in this day and age, you know, so girl, we everybody gets drunk. Girls get drunk. And so occasionally you get now get this. Wait for it. So occasionally a girl gets a ru- roofie, the date mm-hmm. rape drug. Occasionally that happens. But that's just the way it goes. I was like, oh, oh, oh I have to leave now because I'm going to just strangle you. And and I thought about this and I um, I was. I had asked my son about it. He hasn't responded because he hasn't retexted me. <laughs> but because I'm curious about that, the, the fact that the date rape, oh, that's just what happens. When did that become, okay, when did that become the norm, the accepted culture? Well, that just happens. And then the way it was said, it was so cavalier as if, well, you know, that, I mean, there was no, there was no looking at who's the idiot that gave her the drink mm-hmm. or how come if you saw it happen, you didn't help her? You didn't, you know, especially if you saw her just getting totally horribly drunk. I was going to use different words. Uh, well, how come you didn't just take her out and have her, you know, puke in the street and take her home? Mm-hmm. You know, take care of her. And you guys have programs uh, that sort of re-educate people around that, right? Yeah, absolutely. And I think um, I, I wish that that wasn't the case and you know that that I could point to that and say oh I, you know that's not what our experience is that we hear from women in Isla Vista and oftentimes it, it is exactly that that, that you they've know, had this this drink given to them and absolutely and and you know we we like to say being roofied but I mean frankly alcohol is the the top drug that's being used against women to incapacitate them to the point where they can um, you know someone can sexually assault them and so and yet the conversation is constantly well why were you there? Why were you drinking? And it's never on why would someone do this to another person? And so again, the you know, the sort of Elliot Rogers or remain the blip rather than what what is breeding a culture where that would be an acceptable form of entertainment for someone. Um, and, and secondarily, like you said, what, what prevents someone from stepping in and being a decent human being and saying, oh, I see what's happening here. And she's she's not going out that door with you or up those stairs with you or whatever. Um, and so that's a lot of where we're focusing our attention. Actually, we um, have an eight hour intensive training that is a nationally recognized program called Green Dot. And what it does is sort of flip the script um, that we normally see in educational settings, which is men don't be perpetrators and girls don't be victims, you know, to mm-hmm. carry mace and let, go out in groups right. and, you know, don't leave your drink unattended. And really what it does is say, we're all a part of this community and everyone's responsible for keeping it safe. And you may not be drinking as a woman. It doesn't mean that you can't look out for other women who are drinking. Um, and if you're a male, you can absolutely look out for what your bro friends are doing and you know um and if they're doing something sketchy then we expect you as a part of this community to step up and 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 take um take control of the situation um safely and you know and 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 not you know asking anybody to get in fights or anything but um that really what this intensive program is focused on is getting people to get over the hump of it's not my business oh yeah and so i think that's the one thing that we hear over and over again as well if he was trying to get with her and she may be interested and i you know i don't know and it might be awkward and saying right but you know if that was someone that you loved rather than a strange person would you say something you know if it was one of your 
your family members would you say something um and if some if this was happening to you wouldn't you want someone to say something and so what it does is create an us conversation rather than an us versus them women versus men oh thank you thank (laughs) you thank you and i think it empowers men because instead of saying you're going to be a potential perpetrator it's saying help us help us help you know women who are being victimized and help us um prevent you know other boys from becoming perpetrators you know it's it's the responsibility of all of us and so i think it really drastically changes the conversation when it becomes about bystander intervention because it allows everyone to have a part even if you don't drink even if you don't party you know even if you aren't in a fraternity or on an athletic team you know all the places that we typically see targeted for educational messaging that it's really an everybody conversation yeah, absolutely. And it's and it's also a conversation to be taken home mm-hmm. because a lot of the um, culture, I guess is the best way to put it, uh, comes from the parenting that that these that we receive as kids where, oh, you know, it's OK to it's OK to make fun of a girl's boobs as she begins to get them. It's OK to whistle when she's walking down the street it's okay to grab her ass and pat it and go oh you know I was then you know I'm just being it's a compliment are you kidding me it's a compliment really 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 because I never felt complimented by any of that crap right and I remember being a teenager and getting whistled at and I was furious it's like who are you for a I don't even know you and this was before you had to be a uh, concerned about stalkers and mm-hmm. serial killers and all that garbage but you know I don't a I don't know you and b who gives you the right because it it even if it's a verbal thing it invades an individual's space it in, it crosses their boundary and it sends a message to anybody walking by or witnessing it that that's the type of behavior that's tolerated and you know there's some really great anti-street harassment um apps and um, a website out there um, called Hollaback where you can basically, if someone street harasses you, turn around and take their picture and it geotags the location so that it, it can become a sort of public shaming of this is where I was harassed and this is the person who did it to me. Um, and so it's a really unique way of sort of taking back the um, the momentum on that and saying, you know what, that's actually not okay. It's not funny. And, you know, if you really want to go down for that here, I'll, you know, I'll, I'll put your location and, and who did this to me and what happened on this website. Um, so I, I think there are some really unique ways of um, addressing those types of problems. But I, I 100% agree that the bystander can be so applicable to other things and, and it, it, you know, to bullying in, in high schools. And that oh, if you completely. stand by, aren't you just as culpable as somebody um, who's actually doing the bullying? If you, you know, watch something bad happening to someone else, what responsibility do you have? And, it, you know, it's also, um, you know, LGBT harassment and hate crimes and all of those kinds of things. So bystander training and and overcoming um, the fear of saying something if you see something, I think, is applicable to so many arenas. And it's such valuable training to, to be able to provide for students. And that's a hard thing uh, for teenagers moving into young adulthood. It's a hard thing to go, OK, I'm going to be the one that stands up. It, it takes a lot of courage and it takes uh, being willing to be vulnerable uh, and 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 stick your neck out for somebody you may or may not know but it's it, i think it's necessary Absolutely. Well, and I think that the, one of the good things about the training is that it a, asks people to identify what their barriers are to saying something and then ask them how they would overcome them. And it's really giving people a variety of tools to have in a toolkit that they can use when they need to say something. And so um, part of the training isn't just that you have to go up and say to some guy, hey, I see what you're doing by feeding her drinks. I, you know, you can't do that because that's that puts people in a very vulnerable situation. But saying, hey, I think someone just walked off with your keys. They may be trying to steal your car to interrupt the sequence of events. Or if you see someone being abused, going up and saying, you know, hey, do you know what time it is? Or, you know, that it doesn't have to be a I know better than you and I'm going to do this. But there's a lot of different ways that you can intervene that don't put you in danger and that don't necessarily involve you directly. There's uh-huh. you know, lots of different sneaky ways to, to interrupt a, a, a process of something bad happening. And so that's part of what the training involves, which I think is really unique. Well, that's awesome because I would never have thought of doing that. I would have just walked up and said, hey, dude. <laughs> right. I would have. 
I would. I. But so many people wouldn't. And so I think that's where they get caught up, right? It's, right. oh my gosh, do I have to say something to this stranger about what I see that I think might be sketchy? Rather than, hey, I think her friends were looking for her. Like, I, I you know, I promised I would take her back to them. And, you know, being really sort of passive about it, I think, is a really valuable option and viable and, and one that people are like, oh, I could do that. You know, it doesn't have to be the direct, I'm getting in the middle of something that might put me in physical danger. There's lots of different ways for people to intervene. Now, how many, um, how many guys, how many, let me, let me start this way. How many straight guys are coming to these programs to learn about it? To be frank, not as many as we would like, but we're working in that direction. And I think that um, one of the things that we saw, uh, you know, in the aftermath at NIU, and one of the things I think we're seeing here is that people want to do something. And part of, I think, their grieving process is saying, not saying, well, it happened and, you know, we, we, we just have to sit back and be angry about it, but saying, what can I do? And what can I change about myself so that, you know, in the future, if I see something, this won't be allowed to happen. Um, and so I think that people are really latching on to what do I do? And so I think that we probably, you know, again, this is me being very positive, but uh, I think we'll see our numbers go up of men and, you know, and straight, you know, men being involved in that. Um, we're also doing a bystander poster campaign on our campus that features fraternity men saying, you know, um, we we were, you know, we're going to take her home or I saw some guy walking off with her and I thought, okay. And then in small print, it says, this is my chance to do something, you know, those kinds of messages around um, what are men on our campus doing to intervene. And so it's, you know, part of a social media campaign that we're rolling out and these posters are going to be everywhere. So the students will probably be sick of looking at them, but we think it's a really powerful message yeah, and that one is. that other campuses are using as well. That uh, Yeah, that is. Um, when I was in college, the Hillside Strangler was on the loose and, and near the uh, area where my school was. And I remember w- women on campus were not allowed. I mean, they were, well, not allowed. We were highly encouraged to call a security guy who were often the uh, football players, you know, and the fraternity guys, um, to walk you from the library to your dorm or from one dorm to another and not go by yourself or at least go with three or four women. But And so I remember some of these guys, you know, these football guys, you know, walking me very respectfully from, you know, the library at one in the morning to my dorm and not a problem, you know. And then, of course, Saturday night I'd seen them, you know, leaning over the beer keg at the frat party or whatever after football thing. But, you know, I think the men can are able to support and learn how to be respectful of the women and their and their vulnerability. Because it just means that we, uh, at what you're, and what you're saying too, Jill, about the, it becoming an us conversation, and it, because we are all in this together, and, and and it takes two to have a relationship of any kind, and in order to have one that is respectful and compassionate, and all of that, you you have to pay attention. Right. Well, and you have to when things don't aren't respectful and compassionate you know what what can you what can you do and sort of finding your line in terms of when do I say something and so I think like I said those conversations have been really powerful and I think the training um, is slowly but surely sort of taking hold as an idea on our campus and I think that we'll see that increase as people want to reclaim my La Vista and don't want it to have the reputation um, that it got as a result of the tragedy. And so I think we're feeling really good about um, the momentum of the students and, and heading in a really positive direction. Awesome. I'm talking to Jill Dunlap, Director of the Women, Gender, and Sexual Equality Center up at UCSB. You're listening to Living Your Inspired Life. We're going to take a short break and we'll be right back. Hi, this is Susan Burrell from Living Your Inspired Life. I always find it easier and more fun to expand my life by being connected to open-hearted, like-minded people committed to being on the same path I am. If you feel the same way, I suggest you visit a Center for Spiritual Living. There are wonderful communities in Ventura, Ojai, Santa Barbara, Oxnard, Pleasant Valley, Camarillo, and Westlake Village. You'll find terrific people, great information, and more tools to help you live the life you were born to live. So go to CSL.org to find a center near you. That's CSL.org for a center near you. And 
And welcome back to Living Your Inspired Life. I'm Susan Burrell. And please go to livingyourinspiredlife.org to listen to all our previous conversations. We're doing some excellent, awesome work here. And I just invite you to get involved and check out the rest of the site. We have inspirational, uh, the inspiration page, which has a lot of kind of homework, if you will. And we also have a donations page. So if you're finding that you are getting value out of what we do at Living Your Inspired Life, in order to keep us on the air, I would deeply, gratefully appreciate you making a one-time donation or a monthly donation, and we can keep putting positive talk radio on the airwaves. So today I am talking to Jill Dunlap, who is the Director of Women, Gender, and Sexual Equality Center at UCSB, and I want to read to everybody the, the vision statement. Earlier I read the mission statement, but the vision statement is also awesome, you guys, and it just, and it resonates with me, and mostly because of the the vision that I operate and stand on. So I'm going to read their vision. We envision a world free of oppression and violence. We strive for inclusion and equality through our programs, services, and work. We celebrate the richness of our differences while working collectively to create a community of leaders, scholars, and global citizens for the future. Now, Jill, that rocks. In my world, that's how I see things, just like that. Yeah, we, we're really proud of it. We spend a lot of time on it, and we hope that it speaks to the students, that it's not too, you know, wordsmithy, and that they can look at that and see, like, this is a place for me, too, and not just women, but men as well, um, that it is all genders, and that it is involves everybody, and we want everyone to be a part of what we're doing. And also, then, part of, uh, part of your programs, as they were evolving, and the name change happened, and all that stuff, from the Women's Center to the Gender and Sexual Equality Center... There's also this other thing um, I read on the site. It said the new name reflected the myriad of services provided by the department, which includes the Women's Center, LGBT Resources, Rape Prevention Education Program, and Non-Traditional Student Resource Center. So that's you guys are handling kind of a broad spectrum now. We really are. And I think the name change was important to reflect that. Um, and I think, honestly, in, in having done Women's Center work for 12 years, and this is my third campus, uh, you see a lot of Women's Centers changing their mission um, and, and really looking to be more expansive because, again, Women's Center for a lot of male students is a barrier to coming in. And so women, gender, and sexual equity, everybody has a gender. And so, you know, you may be one or the other in transition, but we value you and we want you to be a part of what we're doing on campus. And we're, and we're doing this for the quality of all of the genders um, and and you know also looking at race inequality and social you know class inequality and all of those types of things those are all part of our conversations and our programming that we do ongoing and so I think we're like I said it's not just something that we you know created and then put on a shelf but really the the name change from just the women's center to include all of those different functional areas is is important um, for the campus and, and really recognizing the expansive nature of what it is that we do for students on our campus Mm -hmm. Um, Now, I love that you guys are, like what you said, it is for everybody. And the fact that it is, well, earlier and earlier, as we were talking, we're talking about sexual harassment. And I was thinking about this and, and even in the the gay lesbian uh, group that gets bullied, that is sexual harassment as well. I mean, it's like, you can we can make it different labels, but it's all kind of the same thing, and it all addresses uh, the fact that I don't like you because you're different from me, or I'm afraid of you because you're different from me, or I grew up in a culture where what you are, who you are, whether you're a different skin color, a different uh, sexual preference, a different socioeconomic level. Because you're different from me, I'm afraid of you, and, you know, I'm going to protect myself from you. And this goes back to the us versus them Mm -hmm. idea, which is what we talk about here on Living Your Inspired Life. I I really believe, uh, and our team here believes, that we have outgrown the us versus them way of thinking. And the only way for us to move forward as a global humanity is to recognize that it's a we culture. It's it's a us culture now. 
It really is. And I think a lot of that conversation that we try to have on our campus is, okay, now that it is an us conversation and, and we want to move forward in that direction, what am I doing? So what piece do I play in, in solving this problem? And what am I doing and how am I accountable to making it an us conversation? And so a lot of what we focus on is um, doing a lot of trainings, honestly, in the, um, the Resource Center for Sexual and Gender Diversity, which is LGBT services um, within our department, does a safe space training, both for faculty and staff so that they can put something on their door and students will know that they're a place to go, that they can talk about those issues without being judged, but also for students to say, you know, I maybe went to a small high school and I didn't know any gay kids, but I sure want to know the right word to say. And it provides a forum for people to sort of say, okay, so I've always said this word, Does that is that the wrong word? And, and, and without worry, being worried about being PC, but saying, I want to get it right. And I want to be able to make mistakes on the path to getting it right. And, and that's how we make the us conversation um, more tenable, I think, for people that want to be a part of the movement and yet maybe haven't been before or aren't really sure how they can do that. And so we're trying to provide lots of forums for students to join us in, in working toward that vision that we have. Well, so now, Jill, as you're talking, I'm, I'm wondering how and you, and you say you do all these programs. Are they specific to the kids that come to the center, or do you do a program for the entire campus, you know, like a big rally or something? Because there, there are kids that go into college. I know I was one of them. I didn't know anything. I, I came from, you know, a very middle-class childhood. I didn't know anything, and I and it would you would have to hit me over the – the head with a baseball bat for me to really realize somebody was gay, mm-hmm. you know, and then I got into theater and well, hello. But, uh, but so then I didn't, I just thought everybody was a person. So do you, how do you do that for those kids that don't know what they don't know? For sure. I think one of the things that we um, have done a really good job of, um, and in, it's in the formerly named um, Rape Prevention Education Program, it's now the CARE Office, um, and it's Campus Advocacy Resources and Education because we do training on more than just sexual assault, but also dating violence and stalking. And um, one of the things that we've done in, in that regard, and I think that the Resource Center for Sexual and Gender Diversity would agree that they do as well, is that we target um, already identified populations of students. So student government, which, you know, is not necessarily a homogenous group, but they may be, you know, so busy with just that aspect of their lives that they don't have time to reach out to us and come to a training. So we reach out to them and say, we'd really like it if you would, you know, in your leadership positions on campus, um, you know, help us and support us by attending this training. And then we will, you know, tell the campus, hey, associated students and the student government on this campus value what we do. And they value, you know, trying to be supportive of the LGBT community or survivors on campus. And so they've been really great in working with us on, um, you know, on our sort of outreach campaigns in that regard. The other thing that we do is we reach out to Greek organizations. And um, we, ha- you know, in addition to the sort of m- massive eight hour bystander training that I referenced earlier, we have a shorter program through the CARE program that's called CARE Connect. And really what we're doing is training students to be ambassadors for our office. Um, and we know that we're not, you know, we're not getting invited to those parties in Isla Vista where, you know, something sketchy may happen. But we know that we can train students who um, may disclose to a friend that they have been impacted impacted by dating violence or sexual violence or stalking, and then making sure that that friend knows how to get them resourced to our office so that we can help them, you know, navigate different university processes and understand their rights on campus. And we've seen um, a lot of different survivors come forward and seek services with our office who said, my friend went through your training and she said I should come talk to you. And so really having the students be our mouthpiece is a much more um, impactful um, way to approach it. And so we've, you know, um, trained one member of each of the uh, Greek chapters on our campus in order so that one chapter has or every chapter has at least one student who knows about our resources and so and that's fraternities and sororities. I was going to say fraternities too right? Absolutely. So does that happen every year so that with the turnover of graduation there is always uh, an advocate there? Yeah absolutely and so there's um I think we do uh, four or five every quarter. And so just about every other week, there's one happening. And we do it in in collaboration with um, the local rape crisis center, Santa Barbara Rape Crisis Center, as well as Domestic Violence Solutions. So we have two community agencies in understanding that some students want to sort of keep their campus life separate from what's happening in their personal life. And so if they want to get community resources, they have those um, numbers in their phones as well. And so we, and, and again, that's something that men can really say, you know, I'm not going to perpetrate, and I know I'm not going to perpetrate, and I'm never going to 
abuse my partner, but I want to do more than that. And I want to just not, I, I want to be more than just a good guy and rest on my laurels. I want to be a proactive part of this movement. And so we do see um, a significant number, and I, I, I couldn't say whether it was half and half, but I would say a significant number of men coming to that program and saying, I want to be a resource for my female friends. And if they come to me and they tell me, I'm going to start by believing them and they take a pledge at the end of the training. But secondly, I'm going to make sure that they get resources and that they know they don't have to deal with this alone. Oh my God, that's that's fabulous. Yeah, we've, we've just, it's such a great momentum um, behind this program. And it was um, developed as, as a part of a Department of Justice grant that the campus got for $300,000 um, for three years. And so um, the curriculum was developed in, in partnership with the two community agencies as our consultants. And it's been um, it's been running. And I think in last year alone, we had over 400 students that went through it. So, oh my gosh, that's good. Right. And I so mean, it, your campus is large. So 400 is. students, that's good. It's a good first year. And we think we'll just keep expanding. And as people know about it and hear about it, and they say, I want to do that too and I want that knowledge and I want to be able to support my friends um, and again it's the us conversation and, and so I think a lot of where you see campuses going um, with departments like mine across the country is how do we change the conversation on this so I wanted to, I, I wrote down some stuff that the care connect does and besides what you just said I just wanted to everybody to get this it's about how to help somebody if they tell you that they've been sexually assaulted or to recognize the signs of an abusive relationship. And um, there's so many of us that don't realize that we are in an abusive relationship. Uh, I re as a young adult, I was in an abusive, a, a, a verbally abusive relationship. I did not know it until we were at uh, a, another couple's home and my partner was a, verbally abusing me in front of this couple and the man, in the other in the couple's relationship stood up and told my partner you are not allowed to talk to her like that and if I ever hear you do it in my presence there will be consequences and that's when I went oh 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 you mean no oh I'm not supposed to be talked to that he's right don't talk to me that way and but I did not know what I didn't know I didn't know that I was in an abusive relationship and I would imagine that that's true for lots of women uh, and and men too, pro most likely. You know, our our esteem is at a huge um, developmental stage in in the teenage and uh, young adult years. Well, actually, probably our entire life. But at that point, it's really hard to discern: is this the appropriate way to be in relationship or not? Absolutely. And I think for so many of our students, it's their first serious relationship. You know, they may not have dated in high school and they were very studious and they get here. And that's part of the culture is that you, you know, find somebody and you, you know, partner up. And yet you're so excited to be partnered up that you don't recognize that not every not every partnership is is, is um, as happy as you would hope. And so we get a lot of students come in and say, my roommate is this and I don't know what to say to her. And, and so we do a lot of supporting, I think, of survivors through significant others. Um, and we, we sometimes have parents call to and say, I just what my daughter or son is saying is it's just not adding up and I don't know how to talk to them about it so we sort of talk them through you know you can you can start by saying this and and you know you don't have to be judgmental but let them know that if they wanted to talk to somebody confidentially they can come in and and chat with our office and um, you know we can do you know safety planning with people and you know how do you how do you stay safe if you're continuing in that relationship right now and if you're looking at you know ending it you know a ways down the way you know and, and just not ready there yet that we can work with those students Students as well and so um, I think having like you said a peer say that's actually it doesn't sit well with me the way that that this relationship is unfolding um, can be a significant you know wake-up call yeah absolutely it can make the difference I think between oh, people yeah. deciding for themselves oh if other people think this isn't okay then maybe it isn't okay and I've just normalized it in my own head right well and that's what happens when you're in some sort of a bullying or abusive situation it becomes quote-unquote the norm you 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 become desensitized to it enough just to get through your life, your daily doing, and um, and then it takes it does take. Oh gosh, hopefully it's a it's a it's a piercing look. Wake up before it gets worse. But it does take a wake up call to go. Oh wait, this wasn't right. This wasn't appropriate. I I wow. I need to do something now. 
Right. Well, I think it's especially hard for students in a college setting because your whole social circle is oftentimes involved in who you're dating. And especially, you know, in a sorority system or, you know, on an athletic team that you may be dating people that are, you know, in a fraternity or on another athletic team. And then, you know, what does that mean for your social life if you end that relationship and that people, you know, may you may not want to tell everybody that that's why it was ending. And, And so I think a lot of people stay because of the social impact of what would happen if that relationship ended. Oh, yeah. So I think it's it's definitely harder in, in a campus setting in a lot of ways and, and easier in other ways because you may not be as financially dependent on someone. Um, but we definitely, that's part of what we deal with in our Care Connect training is saying, how, here's how to identify if your friend is not doing so well. And here's how to support them without saying you have to leave, which oftentimes has the opposite impact. Um, and really, it's about believing and supporting and, and knowing that students are probably going to go to their peers before they come to my office and that we just want somebody get, to get them to our office at some point so that they know that they can um, you know, get academic accommodations or whatever that looks like for them on, on campus, that they have additional rights um, you know, under Title IX and, and the Campus Save Act and some of the national um, focus that's being paid to these issues. And, and so getting students to be aware of those resources that they have in a campus environment is really important. Um, and so now I, I have a different question. Sure. Um, I'm wondering, I, my son has a lot of independent, has a lot of friends who are women and they're very independent minded young women, which I just, I love and adore them. And uh, I started to think uh, most of those independent women that are his friends are products of divorce. Mm-hmm. And so I'm wondering, uh, you know, cause I'm, a little bit older. Uh, you know, when I was in college, it was not the norm for their, you know, for your parents to be divorced. And, and, and now in my son's world, it has become more of the norm that people come from divorced families and blended families and all of that. So do you guys notice some sort of difference in that? I think in terms of divorce, a lot of students who come to campus um, may have the opposite experience then. And they're like, well, I, you know, I have to be stable and be in a relationship and I would make it work no matter what. So it actually uh-huh. can sort of have a detrimental impact. Uh-huh. Um, and in other ways, I think some women come to campus and they say, I would never stay with my um, my partner who was, you know, is unsupportive or, you know, not emotionally available or whatever as my father was to my mother. And so I think it can have both impacts um, that people who stay in relationships that they may not have, you know, maybe shouldn't have, um, then it impacts their children and that they were, they say, not for me. And yet on the other side, you know, we have women coming to campus saying, I'm going to find my partner. (laughs) And, you know, I, you know, I would make it work no matter what. And I wouldn't let what happened to my parents happen to me. So, um, and, and sometimes to the detriment of their relationship, right? That, you know, even if the relationship isn't great, they say, you know, I'm going to make it work at all costs. And so um, talking through some of that with, with students who come in, you know, needing assistance with their relationship. Um, is definitely something that we we talk through with them. You know, it's interesting what you just said about um, women coming to college to find their partner because that was very true up until now. Uh, because I I and I and I got to tell you I not that in my generation we were conscious I, I at least I wasn't consciously where I was going to college to look for a partner but that was definitely the undertone it, it's the generational women go to college to get married, men go to college to get a career. And the whole shift in the 70s and 80s from, no, women go to college to have a career as well, has, hasn't has necessarily changed that mindset of, oh, but, and I have to find a partner. I have to have a career and find a partner. Mm-hmm. It's very interesting to watch how our thinking as humanity begins to shift and change because, uh, I think that's we're on that cusp of it right now, Jill, of of finding a way to uh, move into whatever this new way of being is, the us having the conversation and us working together way of being. And some of those old ideologies are really just going to have to be laid down and left behind. Um, I just want to say thank you, Jill, for everything that you've done and everything you're doing up at UCSB, and I am deeply honored to have you in studio with me today to discuss some of this stuff because I really admire uh, the work that you and your colleagues are doing there to support and create a world that works for everyone. 
Thank you so much. It's been such a pleasure. Yeah, I'm I'm deeply grateful. And uh, what's the website so that people can go and the straight website right to you guys? It is wgse.sa.ucsb.edu. And the essay is student affairs. So it's women, gender, sexual equity, dot sa dot ucsb dot edu uh, and i tell you guys even if you don't have a kid going to college it's worth just perusing the website to get inspired that there are people out in the world doing some cutting edge uh work so thank you so much jill dunlap for joining me and i am going to finish with and so it is namaste